in addition to the myriad practical applications, not to mention many mathematically intriguing results, one of the great benefits of information theory is that it gives us a way of mathematically formalizing a notion of information, quote unquote information. And this is one of the most exciting aspects of the topic, I think, when you first encounter it. So the mathematical ideas of entropy and mutual information and relative entropy are sort of the ways that, 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 this, that this notion of information is mathematically formalized. And they're really a powerful tool to have in your sort of mental toolbox. So these ideas are not only absolutely central to information theory and coding, but they also pop up in a lot of other places in mathematics, especially in probability and statistics. And they give you a way of, of formalizing a certain aspect of information. So uh, later on, I mean, several videos down the road, we're going to explore those concepts, entropy and mutual information and relative entropy and so on. We're gonna explore those more formally and we'll, we'll define them formally and look at all their properties. But we're, we're not gonna do that just yet. I, I wanted to just to, to early on in the sequence of videos to just sort of explain, uh, a, to make a point of clarification that, that should be made about this usage of the word information in information theory. Because it can be a, a source of mild bewilder bewilderment, I think, when you, when you first are, are learning this stuff. So the notion of information, quote unquote, that we will formalize in information theory does not directly coincide with the notion of information that we usually refer to in our everyday use of the word information. So maybe I, I'll give you a, a little example to sort of illustrate this. So I have here a two, two pictures and on the left we have, so I, we're gonna think about these two sources of of say messages of, of stuff and um, on the left of course we have a Wikipedia article and this is the Wikipedia article on megabats which is really interesting and then on the right we have in this corner we have the uh, say a few seconds of, of static noise from an old TV set and let's say that we take just enough of this this source over here so that if you were to string out the sequence of zeros and ones, you know, maybe you were to say, you know, this is analog really, but if you were to encode this as the sequence of zeros and ones, you know, corresponding to the pixels in the image, the little dots in the image, that, that we would take just enough of this so that the length of that sequence of, of bits coincided exactly with the length of the sequence of bits that corresponded to this article you know you take all these take all the ascii characters in the the source page for this web page and turn them into binary and you get some sequence and let's say those are exactly the same length now you would probably say i would probably say in you know in our everyday usage of the word information that this wikipedia article has much more information than this sequence of static this this static noise over here for example one thing i learned not too long ago is i didn't even know that these megabats existed there are these bats which have a wingspan of up to five feet they are truly mega they're huge not all megabats are that big but some of them are huge they're also called flying foxes and there's interesting pictures on that page if you want to check it out uh and so it, another thing which is interesting that I learned on this, so this is all a side note, but they were once thought to be very closely related to primates. And, and there was what's called the flying primates theory. These were actually thought to have been very, uh, you know, um, uh, branched off from primates very sort of late in the evolutionary process. And these are found in Africa and Australia and maybe some other places, I don't know. Okay, so anyway, but there's a lot of very sort of interesting information in this article. Whereas if you were to look, I mean, if you were to sort of, if a person were to stare at the, this static noise TV screen, you might think that they were a bit off or maybe that they were in, uh, you know, 
uh, an episode of the Twilight Zone or something like that, because there apparent there's apparently no useful information going on over here. So, and, and the paradox here, or in some, I mean, it's not truly a paradox, but the thing which is a bit strange about the usage of the term information and the notion of information that we formalize in information theory is that this source of information here, this static noise, is is going to have much more information theoretic information than this Wikipedia article. It's going to have much more entropy. We haven't defined entropy, but it's going to have much more entropy, and that's one of the sort of the, the sort of core way that we we quantify information of a source in information theory. And this is going to have much more entropy than this article. And roughly speaking, the reason why is because this is going to be much more random and unpredictable. It's going to be much more unpredictable than this sequence of zeros and ones. If you were to, you know, if, because the English language has a lot of regularities. And not only that, you know, um, HTML code has lots and lots of very highly regular aspects to it so that you could predict future zeros and ones from previous ones much more easily over here than you could over here. And for that reason, this source actually in information theory is going to have more information than this source. So what is going on? This seems very odd. So the first distinction to be made is that our everyday notion of information, sort of in, in, in the everyday sense, we use information uh, our usage of the word it involves a measure of utility or usefulness you know this you know the, this these zeros and ones are more useful than these zeros or ones but that concept that that sort of entanglement of the of of utility in the in our notion of information is completely absent in the information theoretic notion of information so there's no measurement of utility or usefulness of of what we're we're looking at when we quantify information or entropy in information theory. So it might be better, you know, a better word might be data. So you know, instead of so here we have so we have information of course versus data. Data might be a better word to to describe what we are referring to when we're what we're sort of measuring in information theory this sort of entropy it's still not quite doesn't quite hit it but you know because our everyday language is very sort of imprecise and, and vague in some sense so that's the first distinction is that there's not there's no sort of uh, concept of utility in, in information theory well, in the in the standard measure of of information that we use in information theory. So that's the first distinction. The second distinction that I should point out, or I'd like to point out, is that in information theory, information or data it, it, it exhibits it's exhibited through randomness. So we use probabilities to quantify information. And so, in for example, in, in this example here this because this is um uh, let me say it this way so information in information theory is only possessed by something which is random it is only possessed by random variables and this seems very odd when you first encounter it because how could something which is random possess information that just seems very strange so I think that this is primarily confusing because our intuitive notion of information is that it has meaning. It has, you know, uh, it, it means something, you know, like here, this, these words mean something. This has no content. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. But in information theory, the, the notion of information that we, that we w use, it has no meaning per se. So these are, so the, so the first sort of distinction that we made was, let me write these down. So the first sort of distinction was that there's no measure of 
utility in information theory, in information theoretic information. And the second one is that there is that, that information is only exhibited only exhibited through randomness through random variables randomness now one way to resolve this would just be to just by fiat say you know define this is information this is the definition of information that we will use just just define it mathematically and and go henceforth but i think to be able to mentally sort of reconcile this initial apparent sort of strangeness i i i, I think the way to do to to reconcile this is to realize that that the information theoretic notion is simply a mathematical model of sequences of data of the sequences of data that are often transmitted by humans so just so you should think about it as a as a mathematical formalism that 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 captures many of the essential aspects of the sequences of data that we often want to transmit. And so from a mathematical perspective, you know, making this sort of reduction from this very rich notion of information that we have in our intuitive everyday sense, which has meaning and content and uh, utility, all of these things involved in our intuitive notion, this being able to reduce it down to a, a very simple mathematical formal thing in which we have no measure of utility or meaning and uh, you know it's exhibited through these random variables that's a very nice thing to be able to do mathematically speaking but you may be wondering if you know perhaps that's going a bit too far are we throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak so the question might arise in your head as to whether it is still whether it is still useful, I mean, using that word twice in two different contexts, is it still, have we, have we thrown out too much? Is, is what we end up with still a good measure of information or data? And, and I would, I would say that it is, I mean, sort of the, the proof is in the pudding in some sense, because it, it works in many, many cases. But I, I think primarily the, the reason why this is the case that it does work is that our task, our, our problem in information theory is we're trying to design communication systems or a communication system to faithfully transmit messages that are sent by humans. You know, we had that diagram of the source and blah, blah, blah to the destination. And our task is to faithfully transmit messages sent by humans or, or our devices, computers and such and so forth. And so to a first approximation, in the, the simplest case you might you might uh, consider, it's safe to assume that any message sent by our source is is a useful message. That that all messages are useful, and so it's really not our business to be this. To, to, we don't even need to worry about measuring utility of messages because we just assume you know all messages are useful, and therefore we will transmit them. And um, this ex exhibiting information through randomness is, is useful as a mathematical model because oftentimes the messages that we are sending look pretty much random. I mean, there are some structure, but this, that, that structure can be captured in probabilistic models. And so that's why using this this uh, measuring information through the randomness is good because if you were to, you know, the, the best mathematical models, probably mathematical models you can come up with for, for um, you know, language and, and, you know, even like this Wikipedia article, p the models that mathematical models that people use for, for language, for example, are probabilistic. The best models are probabilistic. And so it's not so, it's not so strange once you sort of think about it from that perspective as a, as a mathematical model of these messages. It's not so strange after all to, to, to think about information as being represented or exhibited through randomness. Now, so I said for the, the simplest case, we would basically assume that all messages are useful. And that in some sense corresponds to the, the lossless, you know, if we're trying to do lossless compression, 
and reliable transmission. A slightly more complicated situation arises when we're doing lossy compression because then we actually are in some sense making judgments about what aspects of a message are are unimportant and are safe to discard and what aspects are useful and important and must be preserved because when we do lossy compression we're we're inevitably throwing away some of the message or we're losing resolution or we're distorting it in in some way and so we're making some judgments about utility of certain aspects of the message and so you may you may say well hey you know in that situation we do need to sort of measure utility and you would be right in in in, in some sense and and the way that, that that measure of utility is comes into the theory is through the distortion function so in rate distortion theory which is which is the the study of essentially the theoretical aspects of lossy compression you have a distortion function which in some sense is doing this task for you it's measuring the utility and so using that 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 distortion function what what the way that that it's approached is you can reduce the problem of the the sort of the lossy compression problem where you're having to sort of simultaneously consider utility and 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 compress that and uh and do a good reliable transmission you can reduce your measuring of the information content by by essentially measuring the minimal amount of information required to produce a message with the acceptable level of resolution so you say okay i can accept such and such a level of distortion as measured by my distortion function and then you measure the minimal amount of uncompressible information required to pr to reproduce a message that's within that acceptable range and so you can you can basically reduce it back down to the original case of when i was saying we didn't have to think about utility at all okay so that was a long and and rambling video and uh, uh, but I, uh, and i didn't really you know that wasn't very mathematical and it wasn't very precise but i, I hope that i was able to convey to you sort of the the the, the main idea of, of of the distinctions between our informal everyday notions of information and the information theoretic notion of information and hopefully that this will allow you to uh, you know avoid any possible future bewilderment as we're going through and and you're you're trying to figure out why you know in what sense is this information so later you know uh, when we start talking about entropy and and we we start mathematically defining these things and exploring them in more detail you might want to come back to this video and and watch it later in order to to sort of understand to so sort of reconcile that the use of the word information in that in those contexts okay